<clears throat> All right, well, let's take our Bibles, please, and we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 13. As we continue our studies on the parables of Matthew 13, and I know this is part of uh, our larger study, and we're maybe getting into uh, a lot of detail uh, concerning these things, but I think it is important that we understand the context. You really can't understand the rapture. We all kind of zone in right on the rapture and when that's going to happen. Of course, it is the the very next thing that will happen. Um, But you have to see the the context of all of these things. And there's there's several layers of prophecies where kind of, you know, the the church aids is a layer and the the, the rapture is part of that layer. But we're looking at the kingdom and the mysteries of the kingdom, which has to do primarily with Israel. That's a separate layer. And if you get those layers mixed up, then it becomes confusion. So we're going to try to, uh, to uh, untangle that for you and try to get it where we can have a pretty good understanding. Now, we've been looking at the essentials of prophecy. And again, I think this is really important as well. Uh, if you get these essential things sorted out in your own mind, it will definitely help you to understand the prophetic scriptures. The first essential we looked at was that Israel is not the church and the church is not Israel. Uh, there are two separate programs, two different layers, if you will. And uh, when you mix those up, where you say that, uh, that God is finished with national Israel, you have, to, you have to ignore many, many very clear, clear scriptures that God's program with Israel is forever. And uh, the promises to national Israel will be fulfilled. The church does not fulfill the promises to national Israel, to Jerusalem, to the land of Israel. And so we, we looked at that. The second... Uh, Pro- uh, prophecy essential was uh, that the prophetic scriptures should be interpreted literally. The only way you can make the church to be Israel is to take those scriptures and twist them and spiritualize them to, to make them something not literal. And when you, that's a, that's an injustice to the Bible. We don't we don't do that with the first coming prophecies. You know they're taken literally. Well, why did why would God change it? He, he doesn't change it. Um, they will be fulfilled as they were given. Prophecy essential number three, understanding prophetic gaps. Sometimes that trips people up, but there's a whole record through the Old Testament when prophecies are put together, and yet there's sometimes hundreds or thousands of years between those prophecies being fulfilled, like the prophecy in Tyre and Sidon. Um, I'm sorry? The light. The light. Just leave it on, it's fine. Um, the, so Tyre and Sidon, there was, there was like, uh, 256 years between the first part of the prophecy, the, the Tyre being demolished, and the second part of the prophecy was thrown into the sea. So there's, there was gaps there. And there's prophecies about Jesus' first coming, second coming, that are right together in the same sentence, and yet there's, uh, there's 2,000 years plus in there. So there are gaps. There's gaps between the first resurrection and the, the second resurrection. The nature of the kingdom is really important. To say that the kingdom is just spiritual and that there's no political um, uh, foundation for that when the Bible very clearly says that the king of Israel, who is Jesus, will sit upon the throne of his father David in Jerusalem. If you take that out, then again, you're, you're, what our beef is, is that we believe that the, God knows what he said, we, he meant what he said, and he said what he means, and you don't have to change that. It will come true just exactly as he said. And with that, we looked at the characteristics of the kingdom, the fact that Satan would be bound. Uh, All kinds of different things are going to happen. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, no more war, no more sickness, uh, all disease to be healed, blind, deaf, lame, all healed, bumper harvest, no uh, hunger, Uh, the longevity, the days of my people will be like the days of a tree, uh, where people literally will live right through the thousand year uh, kingdom as was prophesied so very interesting characteristics everybody can understand each other with the same language and then the one we're working on right now which is a prolonged uh, section of this particular point uh, prophecy sense number six is understanding the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven okay so that's we're in that time right now okay but the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven are not just uh, they don't just involve the church uh, when we're looking at these prophecies in the Gospels, this is true in, in Matthew 13. It's also true in Matthew 24, Matthew 25. The church is not in view there. We don't really get an understanding of the church or that layer of prophecy, a new layer of prophecy called the church, uh, which is the beginning of the church and the end of the church at the rapture. You don't get that really until Paul 
or gets it revealed to him and then he kind of unfolds it to us in the epistles like in the in the book of ephesians and so on and so we're looking and i know this is kind of this was on your notes from some time ago but we're looking at that gap there the kingdom in the old testament was prophesying uh, very detailed things about that when jesus came he was offering that kingdom repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand but the problem was they wouldn't repent and they rejected christ and all through his ministry those three years um there uh it got to the point in real culminated in matthew chapter 12 when they attributed his power to the power of satan and that was really when they just locked the door on it and from that time on jesus was getting his disciples ready that it's going to be a, there's going to be something really different you remember in the first part of that he didn't go to the samaritans he didn't go to the gentiles he went only to the lost sheep of the house of israel and his disciples were only good to go to that as well but once they had rejected him he came onto his own his own received him not once that happened then god is now changing gears now those, that changing gears is not something that was revealed in the old testament this this fact that jesus would be rejected the first time and there's a gap in between and in the parables you remember the man that goes into the far country after a long time or after many days he returns with the kingdom and so we have those hints there um, but in the old testament that wasn't really really understood we do have patterns of it with joseph rejected far country for 22 years and then received and became their deliverer moses rejected the first time 40 years in midian in the far country and then came the second time and was received the second time and that's really the point that stephen was making in Acts 17 he says you do always resist the holy ghost as your fathers did so do you so we have little uh, pictures of that but again the disciples didn't understand this they thought jesus is the king and when jesus says i'm going to go to the cross i'm going to be crucified i'm going to die will be raised the third day they had no concept of that this was all brand new stuff to them so in this gap he's getting them ready now uh at, toward the end of his ministry right here where this kind of tapers off he's getting ready uh to help them to understand that the kingdom is going to be postponed and in now it will happen in the future when the king comes it will happen but in this gap is what we're talking about and in matthew 13 he's describing what the world is going to be like in the absence of the king um or what the, the kingdom you know if, if you want to put it like that the kingdom the mysteries of the kingdom in the absence of the king and so uh the time frame that we're looking at and this is something i think is really important um is between these lines right here let me just turn this off for a second um th this period of time we call it the intercalation period or the mysteries of the kingdom it starts even before the cross really matthew 13 as soon as he's been rejected he's now introducing what's going to happen he's now rejected they've rejected the king they'll not receive he's going to postpone the kingdom you can't have the kingdom without the king and so this line here represents the beginning of that which is before the cross it culminates of course in the rejection at the cross and then it continues all the way through until he's received by israel so this this time period starts with his rejection and it ends with his receiving by the nation of israel now is that period of time about the church well yes and no because the church is in there but that's a separate layer because the thing when you get to the end of these parables and he talks about the end and the judgment and we sang about it tonight when the lord will come and he divides the wicked from among the just and you have that in matthew 25 you have it in the parable of the, the dragnet where he gathers the good fish into uh, containers and he casts the bad away but also the parable we're looking at tonight which is the parable of the terrors that um he sends his angels at the end of this period of time and he he takes out those things that do iniquity those those who would offend and he takes out of the kingdom uh the wicked and so he deals with them and they're they're judged and it's the just it's the sea of people who are left behind now the rapture people will use this to say well that's the rapture can't happen um but this period goes beyond the church age it goes into the tribulation period and the, the events before and right at the end of the tribulation period and so in the tribulation period i think some of these things we're going to look at tonight will really like mushroom big time um and especially next week when we look at the parable of the mustard seed and and that you just got to hang with me for a little bit all of these things will come together as we go through the, like the next two two to three weeks you'll see some of these things come together 
But what I'm saying is don't confuse this time with the church age because it's not the church age. This has to do with Israel and their king and their rejection and their receiving. And what's going to happen while he's in exile, while he's in the far country, what happens on the earth. That's what he's describing in these parables. Okay. Um, let's see what the next one is. Okay. We'll look at that in just a second. I'll just leave it up there. I've got that on your, your notes as well. So let's look at our notes for just a moment. And we'll go ahead uh, again. This is review and introduction. This period of time between his rejection and his receiving, he's describing by seven parables, the seven parables of Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 13. And these uh, seven parables, the parable of the sower, and we do have an interpretation for that. And we looked at that last time. And basically, he's looking at a contrast of what's happening now in the absence of the king, contrasted to what it'll be when he comes. So when he comes, the word of God is no competition. There's no opposition. Uh, there's no enemies to the word of God. The word of God is going to be received. It'll all go in the good ground. But not right now. Right now, it's got competition. Right now, there's opposition. Right now, the thing that would describe our age is rejection, primarily, of the word of God. And so he was... Uh, helping the disciples to see that with the four different soils and the hard soil and the uh, the stony soil and the thorny soil and then the good soil that will receive the word and brought forth fruit. Now the next three parables I think are the most interesting and we're, that's, we're going to start with the parable of the tares tonight. Now the parable of the tares also has an interpretation which is brilliant. It's really good when the Lord interprets things for you because then there's no guessing. But when you get to the parable of the leaven Sorry, the mustard seed and the leaven, there's no interpretation. But there's principles that will point out in the first two parables that will help you to understand the next two parables. But those three parables, the, mar the parable of the tares, the parable of the mustard seed, and the parable of the leaven, uh, really explain to us that one of the contrasts between what's happening now and when the kingdom comes is that right now, in the absence of the king, there's going to be a counterfeit kingdom. There's going to be, I put it, I try to get all the, my alliteration sorry, right there, a counterfeit group, a counterfeit growth, and a counterfeit gospel. What, he, what he's described, what he's predicting in the time in which we live, is there will be true children of the kingdom, there will be true people who are saved, but there's also going to be people who are not true, who are counterfeit, and they're going to look like the real thing, they're going to talk like the real thing, but they're false. And there's, there's going to be a, a false church, a false, we, we would call it uh, the word Christendom. Christendom is like the big umbrella that, that, that would include everything that names the name of Christ. So that includes Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Roman Catholics, all kinds of people, liberal, liberal Protestantism, uh, all, and also you know, uh, conservative evangelical groups as well. We're all under that same umbrella called Christendom, but not everything in Christendom is of Christ. And so there's, there is a counterfeit kingdom and counterfeit children of the king, counterfeit believers. They're not true. And then the next time, which is, it gets really interesting, I think, the next two. Uh, and there's, there's very important principles we're going to learn from, that affects us right here and right now that you'll see before you get out of here tonight. But the parable of the mustard seed is a, is a counterfeit growth. We'll get into that. There's a counterfeit system in this Christendom. And then lastly, the parable of the leaven is a counterfeit gospel. There's a counterfeit message. Because not everybody out there is preaching the truth of the word of God and the gospel. And so he warned us about that. And there's things that we have to be careful of and things we need to be uh, uh, really you know, observant of in, in our ministry and, and in our lives. So, so that to say this, that the parables are teaching for us what's happening on the earth when the king is absent. And he's warning us uh, that there's going to be a counterfeit kingdom. And I'll tell you who's really um, involved with that counterfeit kingdom. Uh, who do you think it might be? Satan. Satan is involved. Now, he's not, he's, not, he's not bound right now. He's alive and well on planet Earth. And he opposes everything that God does. And he count Satan is a counterfeiter. And he copies everything that God does. And so you're going to find that he's behind uh, the curtain on, on, on all this stuff. All right, well, let's go ahead and look at the parable. We'll go ahead and read, first of all, the, um, the parable is given by the Lord. And then also 
uh, the interpretation. Now, this parable is given in public. The last three parables, he goes into the house. Now, the house, this is in Capernaum, um, in the north east coast of the Sea of Galilee. And the synagogue is right there, maybe 100 yards from the shore. And then closer to the shore is the house where Peter lived. And that's where they brought, you know, the sick of the palsy and broke the roof up and laid him down. That all happened in, in, in Capernaum. And as he began to speak these parables, the great crowds gathered and they got in a little boat. And he just sat offshore and he taught them. But then they scattered and he, he went back into the house with his disciples in the last three parables, which we'll get to later. Uh, he told to just the disciples. But these are given publicly to even the unsaved. Okay, so let's look at uh, Matthew 13, verse 24. It says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But when men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, we, didst not thou sow seed, good seed, in thy field? For whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. And the servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So that's the parable. And, you know, it kind of goes without explanation. A farmer goes out, he sows wheat in his field, and that night an enemy comes along, and he sows tares. Now, what is tares? Well, tares are like weeds, but... It's a, it's a special kind of weed. If you go over to the page the number two there, page number two, and in that box there, which we have up here, uh, I just want to point out a few things. And you can find this. Uh, I just basically Googled this today and, and uh, put this together. Um, it's actually interesting that they actually have a plant. And really, it's, it's true that it's there in, in, in Israel, but it's also true anywhere where wheat is planted, this plant um, is, always comes up alongside the true wheat, okay? I'm not going to try to read the Latin and everything, but it's basically, we call it tares, the Bible calls it tares, and uh, it's, it's basically called darnel. It's, a, it's a, pure, a spurious wheat, a plant found in Palestine, which resembles wheat both in its stalk and grain, but is worthless. Not only is it worthless, but it's dangerous. If you eat or uh, take this, this uh, uh, darnel in, you know, in a drink or whatever. Uh, the, the Latin word is uh, ab abricus, which means intoxicated. And it's, it expresses the drunken nausea from eating the infected plant, which can be fatal. You eat this stuff, you can die. It's, so it's, it's, it's dangerous, okay? But if you, if you just read some of this here, it's kind of interesting. Uh, he says the plant stem can grow up to one meter tall, three feet tall. Uh, the ears with purple green. The growth of the darnel usually grows in the same production zones as wheat and was a serious weed to, uh, of cultivation until modern sorting machinery enabled darnel seeds to be separated efficiently from seed wheat. Now, I thought that was kind of interesting. That the only way you deal with this, you can't root it up and you can't spray it. Um, basically, what ha they have to wait until harvest. And then if there's some of this stuff in with your wheat, they have modern uh, machines that can sort out because the barley, the barley, the ears of barley when it's ripe will be like a brown, like a light brown color. The ears of this stuff is black. Again, I think it's kind of kind of interesting. It says the similarity between these two plants is so great that in some regions darnel is referred to as false wheat. It bears a this is the important bit. It bears a close resemblance to wheat until the ear appears. Um, wheat will appear brown when ripe. Darnel is black. Okay, so here. You know, if I, was, if I didn't have it down here and I just said, tares look identical to wheat, which is the wheat and which is the tares? I mean, if I was looking at that, I would say, well, that kind of looks like wheat. But that's actually the, the tares. That's actually darnel. And this is wheat over here. Now, the point about that is this, and, and it's interesting that this is, you know, this is, this is actually, you know, documented. Go online and look this up. And it's, it's, it's a thing. So Jesus is not making this up. This is actually what would have happened. Uh, in his day. But the point that he's making is that when these weeds, these tares are sown, 
Um, they're sown to gather as seeds, and then the sunshine, the rain, and the seeds begin to sprout. You see little green shoots coming up. You cannot tell the difference when those shoots start coming up between the, the true wheat and the false wheat. Not only that, when they're growing up, and it, it takes a very, um, there, there's, he describes on there, there's some, some things about uh, the spikelets are oriented edgeways. Uh, they have a single gloom, whatever that means. But uh, a trained eye can probably get in once the, once the stalk's coming up. It can probably be able to tell the difference. But for the normal person, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And then the ears start to come. Again, you still really can't tell the difference. I can't tell the difference. You can only tell the difference when harvest comes and when they ripen because the tares will be black and the wheat will be brown. And so that's what's going on here. And so an enemy hath done this. And the servant says, well, do you want us to go and you know, rip it all out, rip, rip the tares out? He says, no, because if you do that, you're going to rip the wheat out as well. And it could be that the roots are kind of intertwined as well. So if you damage one, you're going to damage the, the, the good stuff as well. So that's the, that's the parable. And he says, wait until the harvest and then the reapers will be able to sort them out. And what they're going to do is they're going to get the tares and bundle them together first. And they're going to burn them. And then the, the wheat will be gathered into the barn. So that, that, that separation happens at the end when the harvest happens. Okay, now thankfully we do have an interpretation. So if you come down to verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto them, Now this, I said that he gave the, the last three parables, okay? But he also gave, he gave this parable to uh, the crowd, but then he gave the interpretation only to his disciples. So they're in the house. And he said unto them, verse 37, He that soweth the, the good seed is the Son of Man. Okay? So who's the good sower? Jesus. Okay? Verse 38, the field is the world. Okay, so the field is the world. And Jesus is sowing seed. Well, what's the seed? The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Okay, so Jesus is involved in the world and preaching the gospel. People are hearing, believing the gospel and getting saved and getting born again, born into the family of God. These are the true children, born again people, redeemed of the Lord, belong to the Lord. These are saved people. And Jesus is likened to those two, each, each person, each, each saved person is like a seed that he's planted that will grow and hopefully bear fruit. Then he says in verse uh, 38, the last part, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. Okay, so let's look at our notes then. The first thing we have to understand is, is really what's going on here. And that is that there's two different kinds of seed. There's true saved people and there's the children of the devil. And the seed of Satan that he's planting is these are people who are not saved. Not only are they not saved, they stand in opposition of those who are saved. But the other thing is, is that they're sown together and they look like each other. Yeah. So... Um, so the bad seed looks like the good seed. Now, Jesus talked about this before. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 7. And in Matthew chapter 7, he warns us because he uses that word beware. Beware means you have to uh, be careful because he's warning us. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, he says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. The word straight means narrow. For wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Now in the kingdom, it's not like going to be like that. In the kingdom, um, there won't be any unsaved. There will not be a broad room. Everybody there will be saved. Verse 14, Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way that, which leads to, unto life, and few there be that find it. Verse 15, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Now, when a, when a false prophet walks through our door there, is he going to look like a false prophet? No. Nope. What's he going to look like? He's going to look like us. <laughs> he's going to, because he's dressed in sheep's clothing. Now, he's a wolf on the inside, but he he's look, looks like one of us on the outside. Now, how are you going to tell the difference? Well, you'll, you'll find out the difference by, by their fruit. By their fruit, you shall know them. But 
but also the fact is that they, unless you know, they hide everything, they're go you're going to find out what they believe probably pretty shortly because they're there. They come in. Paul talked about this one. Let me get this in it. In Galatians chapter one, false brethren brought in unawares under the radar. Okay, but they didn't stay under the radar for long. They get in, and then as soon as they get in, they uh, they do their work. And so um, he says in verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come unto you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly there are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or things of, of th figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth fruit. They'll not be able to help themselves. Won't be able to help themselves. Just give them a little time and they will be known for what they are. And that's true for you and me too. Okay. Then he says, uh, down in verse number 21 not everyone that saith so yet false prophets then you also have false professors not everyone that saith unto me Lord Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he which doeth the will of my father which is in heaven and the will of the father is to believe on his son whom he hath sent verse 22 many will say to me in that day Lord Lord have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works these are people that look like sheep but they're not true children of God they are children of the devil uh, they are terrors, but, they're, but they look like wheat because they're doing all the stuff that wheat does. And the point is that they would even deceived themselves, but, but the clue is in the passage. What was it that they were trusting in to get them into the kingdom of God? Mm -hmm. What they did and what they said. We have prophesied in it. We've done many wonderful works. And when, so when they were challenged, that's what they clung to. Now, if you're challenged, if, if God says, why should I let you into heaven? Why should I let you into the kingdom? What would your defense be? I say, Lord, I don't deserve to be there. You, <laughs> Jesus, you, only you and your death on the cross is my only hope for heaven, my only plea. And Lord, if that doesn't work, then I have no hope. Because right. you're all my hope. Right. And the Lord will say, enter thy into the joy of the Lord. Because that's the key. These people were trusting in the wrong thing. In verse 23, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So here's people doing Christian things doing godly things, work of the kingdom, if you will, uh, but they were not children of the kingdom. So that's exactly what Jesus is getting at here in these parables, the parable of the terror. What he's saying is not everything that glitters is gold, not everything that names the name of Christ is truly belonging to the Lord. So as you come down to the interpretation of the parable, um, as we've begun, begun that and the in verse 39, he says, The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. Now, let me help you to understand that. When the Bible talks about the end of the world, the, the word worlder is, has to do with time, not place. Okay? It's the end of the age. Okay? And there's several ages. Okay? We're in what we would call the church age. The age that he's speaking about here is this age of rejection and the kings in exile. That's the age that he's speaking about. And so at the end of that particular period of time, when the, when the king is absent, this is how it's all going to end. But that's not to say that it's the end of the world, that the world gets burned up at that time. Because you've got a thousand years after Jesus comes back, after this age, there's another thousand years of, a, of, a, of, a, of another age. That's why Jesus said, you know, the unpardonable sin, uh, it will not be pardoned in this world or in the world to come. Okay, That's not talking about like heaven. You, the Roman Catholics use that to talk about forgiveness in heaven you don't you don't need forgiveness in heaven that's why they have purgatory and prayers for the dead not that's a misunderstanding of that because it's not speaking about the world as uh, to come as far as heaven it's speaking about the age to come it's speaking about this age and in the millennial age it won't be tolerated in the millennial age and so it's not the end of the world where the world gets burned up now the world will get burned up uh, but that not here this is speaking about the end of this particular segment of time that he's introducing to us um, he says the reapers are the angels, as therefore the terrors are gathered and burned in the fire. It's interesting that the, the terrors are gathered first. So this is at the second coming. And you've heard, most of you have heard me preach about, you know, the different raptures that are happening. We always talk about the rapture, about the rapture of the church. There's all kinds of raptures. And in the book of the Revelation, the angel is sent forth uh, because the, the vine of the earth is, is fully ripe and, and they, they go in with their sickle and they, they cut off the cluster. Speaking about people. And they're cast into the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. 
And that doesn't happen once. There's several, there's several different judgments that happen at the second coming because there's different people. You have the judgment of the Gentiles, the, the sheep nations in Matthew 25, uh, the sheep from the goats. That's, that's a separation, that's a judgment. But then the Jews are, are, um, are, are judged as well. Uh, those unbelieving Jews will be taken. Uh, also, um, you have uh, the, those who uh, receive the mark of the beast. I think they're the ones that get taken and thrown into the wine press. There's several different judgments. And it's interesting that it puts it like this because they gather the tares and what do they do? They, they bind them into what? In the bundles. Now the wheat is all gathered and goes into the barn. There's no separation of the wheat. They all go into the barn together. But the tares, it's different because they, he takes them and he binds them in bundles. So there's not just one big bundle. There's several bundles. And I think that could, again, this could be philosophy here. But I think he's, he's, he's alluding to the fact there's going to be several different judgments at the end of this, this age, at, this, uh, at the end when, when Christ comes back. And it says in verse 41, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. Well, what does that mean? How do the angels gather you out? Well, they physically remove you. Okay, that's called rapture, harpazo, seized by force. Now, when Jesus comes for us, now this is important because in Matthew 24, there's a scripture where, where, where the Lord actually brings the saved Jews and lifts them and brings them to Jerusalem. And people say, oh, it's the rapture, it's the rapture. It's not the rapture. When, when the rapture happens, do the angels come and get us? Now, think about this. No. Who comes and gets us? Jesus comes to get his brain. He doesn't send the angels for us. He comes. And so he's coming for us as his, as his brain. And at the end of this period of time, now that's what there's a whole lot of things going on here. And we'll get to that later on, Matthew 24, where he sends forth his angels and he gathers the elect from the four winds of heaven and stuff. And they said, that's the rapture. It's not the rapture. The angels don't come and get us. And you know, that's quoting an old, actually four different Old Testament passages. That passage in Matthew 24, four different Old Testament passages. And we'll get to it later on. And all of those passages have to do with Israel. They have to do with Jews. Okay. And so you can't say well, God speaks about that four different times in the Old Testament. When he gets to the New Testament, it's different people. In the Old Testament is always the Jew, but Matthew 24 has got to be the church. No. We'll get to that later, but I'll, and I'll show it to you. But we're just saying about the parable here uh, toward the end that the angels come and gather out of his kingdom the things that offend and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear let him hear. So this is the point when he comes and the saved get to go into the kingdom. Now is that talking about us? Well it, it is and it isn't because we come back with them. We're already saved. We're already glorified. Um, but what this has to do primarily with is this period of time here, uh, right at the end. Um, are there people that get saved in the tribulation? There are millions and millions of people that get saved in the tribulation period. And, uh, and that's what Jesus is meaning in, in, those, in Matthew uh, 24 and Luke chapter 17, where he says, two, two is in a field. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Now, in, in Noah's day, Concerning the earth, who was left on the earth and who was taken away from the earth? The saved were left on the earth. When the ark touched down, there's only eight people that repopulated the earth. So the, the just people, the saved people were left on the earth. Just at the end of this period of time, the people who are left on the earth to go into the kingdom are saved people. Well, what happens to the unsaved people? What happened in Noah's day? The unsaved people were removed. They all died. They were the ones taken out. And in those passages like Matthew 24, Luke 17, where he says two are in a field, one's taking the other left. Um, two women are grinding at the mill, one's taking the other left. I say, well, that's very like the rapture. It's very like the rapture. Well, of course it's like the rapture because it is a rapture. It's not our rapture. It's their rapture. And the disciples say, well, where are they taken, Lord? And here's what he says. Wherever the eagles are gathered together, there they will be. Now that has, that's, in, that's, that's Armageddon. That's where Matthew, uh, Revelation 19, where the flesh of great men, mighty men, are devoured by the eagles, the birds of the air. So that's, they're taken to a place of judgment. So it's kind of like a rapture in reverse. He takes out the unjust, the unsaved, the dwellers, the people who have received the mark of the beast, or the unsaved Jews, and he takes them out, and he leaves the saved people 
who will enter into the kingdom. But he doesn't take he doesn't take all the unsaved people out like that because Matthew 25, you have the Gentiles that are gathered. And there he separates them, the sheep from the goats. That's a different thing. That's why I'm saying that there's bundles, there's different things that happen at the end. Okay. Um, under number two, then, number one, the sowers are Jesus and seed. Number two, the seed are the people, the, the, the saved and the unsaved. The tares and the wheat grow together. Could be described as Christendom. And the tares and the wheat have a likeness. It's a religious similarity. Both claiming Christ. Both looking like sheep. Yet the tares are masquerading. Wearing sheep's clothing. They are counterfeit imitators. Imposters. Now let's kind of look at that. For just a moment. Uh, let's take just a few minutes to look at some of these scriptures. Because it's very very important. Let's look first of all at Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. Now again Matthew 24 is at the end of the tribulation period. The church is not in view here. But there's saved people in the tribulation period. It starts out with 144,000 Jewish witnesses. How did they get saved? I don't know. But they get saved. And uh, there's people, um, you know, the Lord's sovereign in all that he does. And there's 12,000 from for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're all male and they're all virgins. So I mean, how do you figure that? Well, God has a way of doing that. And they're not Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way. They're Jews. Okay, and they evangelize the whole world. There's also two other witnesses, which I believe are Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses in the book of the Revelation. And their ministry is primarily to Israel, to turn Israel. And if you read Malachi, Elijah's job in the latter days is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. In other words, to bring revival to the nation of Israel, because many of them are going to get saved. And in fact, you'd have to say one third are going to get saved, because two thirds are going to die, according to Zechariah chapter twelve. So that's um, as far as Jews, if, you know, if you're looking at 18 million people, 18 million people during the Second World War, one third of them died, 6 million died, left 12 million. And now they're building it back up to 18 million. Okay, There's still more people outside Israel. There's 8 million people in Israel right now. But in Zechariah 12, it says two thirds will go through the fire, two thirds will die. So that means that 12 million would die. That's, that's, an, that's quite an amazing. Because when you think about the, the Holocaust, you're thinking, oh, what? No. I mean, if you ever. By the way, you should study that. You should look. There's all kinds of documentaries on, on YouTube and different other places that you can look at. Historical film documents of what happened uh, during the Second World War and before that. And you owe it to yourself to find that. It'll shock you. And the fact that that's going to be even more... Because Jesus said, then shall be great tribulation, which it was not since the beginning of the world of this time, nor, nor ever after. In other words, Jesus said, this future tribulation is going to be worse than Hitler. But it's the last. It's the last time for them. And our hearts certainly go out to them. But anyway, um, losing my train of thought here. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, look at verse number 4 and 5. He says... And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So these are terrors. They say, I am Christ. They're deceivers. They go after the people of that day and say, well, we're the true children, and we're, you know. And he says, no, they're, they're deceivers. Now, this is after the rapture. This is during the tribulation period, but you still have the same, because these parables are not about the church. They're about the time in between. His rejection on this rate. So that also includes the tribulation period. So in the tribulation period, everything we're talking about here is still going to be true. Okay, look over at uh, Matthew 24, verse 11. He says, And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Again, not the church age. Now, does this affect the church age? Are we living in the gap? Yes, so therefore it's going to affect us too. But it's not... It's not only for the church, okay? I'm trying to help you to understand the context of that. All right, look over at 20, uh, 24, verse 24. He says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. By the way, when the Bible speaks, mostly when the Bible speaks about the elect, it's speaking about Jewish people. And even in Romans chapter 11, he says, Concerning the gospel, they're enemies for your sakes. Uh, but concerning the fathers, they're, they're beloved for the father's sake. The elect are beloved for the father's sake. It's been about Jews. 
And it, it uses the term elect and they're not even saved. Because the word elect means chosen. They are the chosen people. Even if they're not saved, God still has a, a, a chosen purpose for that people. You see? And he has made promises that will be fulfilled. Okay, look over at Second Corinthians chapter 11. Now, obviously, uh, some of these verses, and maybe most of the verses we're looking at now, in the epistles uh, concern the church. But the same principles are true. And, and I want you to hang in here with me because there's a very important application to this for us today. Okay, So Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about terrors. We're talking about people who are false, children of the devil, um, yet they look like they're Christians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 3 and 4, Paul says, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He's speaking about deception. He says, I'm worried about you. Verse 4, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, that's another of a different kind of Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which we, uh, ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye may well bear with him. Now, here's what he's, now Paul has been a little facetious here. What he's saying, see, see you people, I came and give you the truth, and you hate me for it. And you see in people, you'll have false prophets come in here, preaching another Jesus and another gospel, and you'll put up with it, you'll listen to them. You're going you're gonna to criticize me, which I'm true, and yet the false are going to come in here, and you're going to give them the time of day. He says, I'm worried about you. You're open to deception. Now, if you'll come down to verse number 13 and through 15, he elaborates that a little bit more. He says, for such, he's talking about these false, uh, false teachers that are annoying the church of Corinth. And he said, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers are also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Do you see what he just said there? If the devil walked in here tonight, he wouldn't come in with horns and a pitchfork. He would come in here as an angel of light. He would have a wonderful, pleasing personality. He would be uh, very um, outgoing. He would be very winsome, uh, very charismatic. He'd be very uh, convincing in his arguments. And he says that's exactly the way his, uh, his ministers are. They're transformed in the ministers of righteousness. They're ministers of light. And yet they're false. Right. You know, Satan's not stupid. You know, if he comes in, if, if his, he or his emissaries come in here um, and they, they look evil and they look dark and all of that, well, we will. Oh. But what his, his goal is to deceive you. And so he's going to come in looking, talking the talk and walking the walk and, and everything. You're going to tick all the boxes and it looks right until he, until he sets the hook. Then we're in trouble. Okay, look over at First uh, John chapter four, and of course, four. You know, John dealt with this. We just get finished with this, and First uh, John chapter four, verse one. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. We've seen this over and over again. John warns, Paul warns, Peter warns, Jude warns of these false teachers, these false prophets. And again, they're going to come to you dressed up. Now, let's go back to Galatians. I do want you to see this. We'll finish with this. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Now, the churches of Galatia were, were tormented by what they called the Judaizers. They said, well, you can believe on Jesus, but you've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the law of Moses. And Paul says, no. Remember that whole deal in Acts 15? And they used Cornelius as an example of that. Well, that was going on here in Galatia. And some of them were going for it. The churches were being affected by this. And Paul, this is one of the hottest letters that Paul writes. He gets really, really upset. Why does he get upset? Because if you mess with the gospel, you're, you're damning souls. And that's what the terrorists want to do. That's, the, that's their mission. Because Satan is behind this. And he wants to damn people. And deceive people. So he says in chapter 1 verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him. That called you into the grace of Christ. Unto another gospel. That's another of a different kind of gospel. Which is not another of the same kind of gospel. See there's two different Greek words for another. 
So it's, it's, uh, it's another of a different kind, which is not another of the same kind. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than what we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. You know, if you got an angel coming, like Moroni, that's what the Mormons follow. Joseph Smith said that the angel Moroni came and uh, led him to the, the golden tablets and gave him the, the spectacles where he could interpret the... Um, the book of Moroni, or the book of Mormon. And the angel, he says, even an angel comes to you and he preaches um, unto you another gospel, let him be accursed. Verse 9, he repeats it, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. He's hot. Don't mess with the gospel. Don't change the message. And we're going to talk about that in another parable. The parable of the leaven deals with that. Now let's look at chapter 2 and verse number 4 and 5. Now he's talking about how they went up to Jerusalem, him, him and Barnabas, okay? And if you look, and I think this actually deals with Acts 15, who counsel at Acts 15, if you remember that. But if you look at verse 4, And that because of false brethren on a words brought in, who came in privily to spy our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they may bring us into bondage, to whom we give place by subjection? No, not for an hour, not for a second. That the truth of the gospel may continue with, with you. See that? So that was the Judaizers that came to Jerusalem. And he talks about the Pharisees. It says that they were believers. But they were trying to entrap people. Um, trying to bring them under the yoke of bondage of the law. And the point that Paul was making. If you're trusting in the law or circumcising the Savior. Then Christ will profit you nothing. You must trust him only and exclusively. But it's interesting how he said that because that false brethren, if they're false brethren, they're not true brethren. If they're not true brethren, they're not brethren at all. If they're false brethren, they're terrors. They're unsaved people. But they come in with a religious message. They come in like sheep and they're coming in privily. That means privately, despite our liberty. They're coming in under the radar. And that's why I said a few weeks ago, you've got to be careful who comes into the church. It's not a free for all. It's not. And if you, if you think it is a free-for-all, then you're going to have a bunch of, bunch of wolves in here. And the Bible says they will not spur the flock. They're here to do damage, pain. And so we don't want that. Now, this, this all fits together, you see, with what Jesus has been prophesying about this. Okay. Now, let me hurry to get finished with this. Under number three, the field. The field is the world, verse 38. Of Matthew 13. So the terrors are flourishing in the world. Acting like believers. Spreading a false message. So what should we do about these counterfeits? I'm going to make a point about the church here in just a minute. But the field is not the church here. The field is the world. Okay. So are the Jehovah's Witnesses wrong? Yep. Are the Mormons wrong? Are Roman Catholics wrong? Most of them. Their, their, their hierarchy and their teachings are wrong. Some Roman Catholic people are saved. But... Um, they're saved in spite of their doctrine instead of because of it. So what should we do then? Should we, we strap our, our AK-47s on or our AR-15s or whatever and get out here and go down to the Kingdom Hall and blow them up? I'll sort them out. We'll put a stop to it. Well, I'll tell you what, that's the way some people operate. That's the way, actually, that's the way Roman Catholics operated back in the Dark Ages. And Anglicanism and Lutheranism, they all were involved in religious wars. And Islam, of course, Islam is like, that's their... The tools of their trade they get their converts at the edge of the sword you know you either convert or you die but what the, the servant said that, that I did Lord do you want us to go and root them out and the Lord says no don't root them out don't touch them leave them alone let them alone until the time of harvest and the angels will come because just like this, this thing about the, uh, the, the modern machines are the only thing that are able to sort out the difference between the tares and the wheat. Uh, we're not going to be able to do that. And the roots might be intertwined and you start going after somebody because uh, physically and, and uh, to, trying to destroy them physically in the world and trying to wipe them out. You're going to get it wrong. God is the judge of that. And so people say, well, Christianity is a disaster because you look at all the religious wars, the crusades and all that. Let me tell you something. Born again Christians who believe the Bible and follow the teachings of Christ never get involved in that kind of thing. They're, they're always the victims. They're the ones that get burned to death. They're the ones that die at the edge of the sword. The true believers do not propagate religious wars. They're on the receiving end of the sword. Always. And so it's a false claim when they say that 
biblical Christians are involved in religious wars. We're forbidden from that right here. And so, by the way, when Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom, will it be different? Oh, yes, it will. Because he is the judge and he rules with a rod of iron. So there's a contrast between what it's going to be like then and what it's like now, but we are not to touch them. Now, if you turn over the page, I'll try to get through this quickly, it's, and this is the important bit. It's all important, but this is how it applies to us. Now, he says the field is the world. Now, I'm going to make the point, which is really important. The field is not the church. In other words, and I'm going to tell you this, there shouldn't be any tares in here. There should be wheat in here and no tares whatsoever. There should be true sheep in here and no wolves whatsoever. It only takes one wolf to eat half the flock. And so he's not talking about the church, because the church is not even in view here. But we're in this period, the church is in this period of time, so a lot of these principles apply to us. And so the field is the world, and in the world you're going to have falsehood. There's going to be a jungle out there, but it shouldn't be a jungle in here. Jungle out there, in here is different. So the field is the world, and society at large, and people should have liberty, including religious liberty, even liberty to be wrong. Okay? If you want to be a Mormon, believe the wrong things, and you want to be a Roman Catholic and believe the wrong things, and Jehovah's Witness believe the wrong things, or, uh, or some sort of a Protestant, or a Baptist who's believing the wrong things, you're welcome to do that. We're not going to cut your head off. Because you know what? You're going to have to stand before God with that, just like I'm going to have to stand before God with what I believe. Right. And so you have liberty to be wrong. That's in the world. And by the way, you have to say that people are free to choose, but there should be the possibility of a choice. I think in a free society, you should still have the ability to go to somebody, not with a sword, but with a Bible and with words and sit down with reason and kindness and respect and to have a conversation and to have a debate and have rhetorical persuasion to win people over to the truth with our words. There is no violence in that. Now, we're living in a society where they're trying to make that uh, outlaw. You're not allowed to even mention your position. Not allowed to have a debate. They won't debate you. I'll tell you something, Adam, boy, you're going to get me started tonight. I said this to Leslie the other day. You know, it's a really sad thing when debate has no effect. Have you ever noticed in Washington, they have these debates when was the last time that a debate in Washington ever changed anybody's mind from the other side? I mean, I think you can have the greatest debater with the most logical, clear truth that he's presenting to the Democrats or whoever you want to talk. I mean, same through with the Republicans, I would think. But you have somebody giving a point of view and he's debating and he's arguing, he's put these arguments forth. And anybody with a half a brain would look at that and say, well, this guy's right, he's right. He's got a point. But they all sit there like this. And when it comes to vote, they all vote together. They don't change. They're not open to reason. And I think it's a dangerous thing because what good is debate then when people are so entrenched? But what I'm saying in a free society, you should still be able to go with the Bible and sit down kindly with somebody, respectfully with somebody, and tell them that they're wrong. Or at least give them the arguments and they have the right to tell you that you're wrong. And they, 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 you've got to listen to their arguments. Because at the end of the day, we want truth. Now, the church is different from the world. The church must not be allowed to be infiltrated with falsehood. You know, people don't come to this church and join this church and then we have the debate about the deity of Christ. That's not going to happen. If you don't believe the right things about Jesus and who he is and what he did, you cannot be a member in this church. That's why, and Baptist churches are different because we're guarding the membership. Okay, now if you're born in an Episcopal church, a Roman Catholic church, a Presbyterian church, a Methodist church, you're basically sprinkled as a baby and you're in. Yeah. And what you've got then is you've got lost people growing up in the church and sometimes they don't get saved, some of them do get saved, some of them don't get saved. So we have a mixed multitude in the church congregation. You've got saved people and lost people. In the you've got tares and wheat in the church. It's not supposed to be in the church. And that's why when you join this church, you've got to come up here and you've got to give a credible confession of your faith in Jesus Christ. I will ask you, have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? I'll ask you in private, have you been saved? Do you know that for sure that you're saved? And there should be a credible profession of faith. And then, as a public testimony to that, they get dunked, they get baptized, and symbolizing death, burial, and resurrection, but also association with the Lord and with the Lord's people. 
And they're saying, we're one of you. We believe. We have, before you ever join this church, I'll, I'll bring the articles of faith. There's like 29 different articles. And I give you those articles. Now, you, I want you to read them carefully. And then I'm going to come to you and I'm going to say, now, do you believe that? Now, some people are just saved. They don't know what to believe. That's different. But you get somebody who's been saved for 40 years and he says, no, I'm not a premillennialist. I'm not a pre-tribulationist. And all kinds of other things. And I'll simply very kindly say to you, you know, you need to go find a church that you agree with those things because we're not on the same page. And I can't recommend you the membership of our church if you don't believe the same thing. That's, that's why we have a constitution. That's why we have articles of faith. Because we're guarding the fellowship of the church. There shouldn't be tears in here. There shouldn't be wolves in here. And so we try to keep them out. We try to put those checks and balances there to try to... Now, now let, me ask, let me ask you something. Do you think there's any tears in our church? I can nearly guarantee that there will be a tear in here. It's one of the things that keeps you up at night as a preacher. That the people I'm preaching to on Sunday morning, maybe week after week, month after, maybe year after year, and some of them are going to go to hell because they're not seeing. Because as much as we will try, some will slip through. Now if they do try, if they come in as a wolf, start causing troubles, then the shepherd's going to be on them. Um, but the church is not the world. The field is the world. It's not the church. And so um, we have a responsibility. Now, I'm, I'm not going to have enough time to go through all these things. Um, but what you're going to find in, in Romans 16 verse 17 and 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is that the church's responsibility to guard the membership. And if somebody, is, and by the way, this is not just um, unsaved or even doctrinal issues, but if somebody's involved in serious public sin, the church has a responsibility to discipline and to address that. Um, the church has given the responsibility to keep itself pure. And once the church becomes a free-for-all, then it's lost its salt, it's lost its light, it's lost its testimony, it's lost its candlestick, it's lost its effectiveness. And so the church has a responsibility to discipline itself. And that's what those verses talk about. You can read that later for yourself. And so it is the responsibility of the church to evaluate, to discern, to identify and disassociate with falsehood and false prophets. Now, we're going to talk about that more when we get to the parable of the leaven. But let me close with this. Ecumenicalism. And ecumenicalism um, is this. Actually, this is kind of all that, you know, they have ecumenicalism and interfaith dialogue. You may have heard that. You say, what is that? I don't really understand that. Well, stay away from it because it's false soon. Okay, now the word ecumenicalism, and I actually just found this out today. I, was, I studied it before, but it didn't come out, uh, get, get uh, the answer to it. Um, ecumenical comes from a Greek word, okimeno. Actually, in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, where all the world was to be taxed. That, that phrase, all the world, it's all the inhabited world. That's what okimeno means, and that's where you get ecumenical from. Ecumenical means the whole inhabited earth. It means everybody. And so ecumenicalism really is not just about, you know, the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians getting together. By the way, you know, I have, I have, I have, I have very dear friends who are Presbyterians. In fact, my uncle's a Presbyterian and he led my daddy to the Lord. And if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be saved. I don't know. But what I'm saying is you can have Methodist friends, you can have Presbyterian friends, you have people who are saved, they're Church of God, they're Pentecostal, whatever. I mean, um, we should love those people. And if they're saved, you should acknowledge that they're saved. Okay. Well, you're not a Baptist, so I'm not sure if you're saved or not. That's wrong. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go join their church if they're Pentecostal. And I, I don't believe what they believe. I'm, I'm not a Methodist. I don't believe in bap baptizing babies. So there's things that I don't agree with. But if they're saved, then they're my brother in the Lord. And I can you know, deal with them on that, on that level. Um, but you see, ecumenicalism is taking everybody together, the whole inhabited earth together. And by the way, ecumenical doesn't stop with Protestant denominations. In fact, to be honest with you, ecumenicalism is really the thrust of the Roman Catholic Church. And really what it's about is bringing everybody back into the fold to the mother church. And so you'll find, if you study that, you'll see that all these, these mainline Protestant denominations that want everybody to gather, unity of, of, of Christians. Now the problem with that is this. Tours. I had a call 
um, years ago when I was in Northern Ireland, this lady, very nice lady, she was very pleasant, very kind. She said, you know, she said, now we're having this ecumenical meeting down in Belfast and we're calling all the churches and we want you to come. We'd love you to come to our ecumenical me meeting. And I, <laughs> I, hate these, I hate these conversations, I really do. And she says, now can we count on you to come? And I said, no. Oh. And it was like, I, you know, I just you know, killed her dog or something. Oh. How could you say such a thing? Why, why, you, why can you not come to this meeting? It's going to be a wonderful meeting. What do you do when you get a question like that? What, what's, what, how do you respond to that? So here's, here's some questions I wrote down. Questions for uh, ecumenical, ecumen, ecumenic, or ecumen, ecumenicalists. And here's a question for them. Who are the woos in our world today that Jesus warns about in Matthew chapter 7? You see, not everybody that names the name of Christ is Christian. And what you're doing is you're bringing all the Christians together and thinking it's a wonderful thing. In order to do that, you've got to throw all kinds of doctrines out. And, uh, but then you're, you're inviting the wolves in. So ask them, well, who is the Jesus warned, beware of the wolves. Who are the wolves? Can you name names? I'm going to I'm guarantee you something. They'll not be able to come up with one name. If anything, they'll say that you're the wolf. Because they have no concept of this, what Jesus is talking about, about false believers and false prophets and all of that. And they have no uh, mission at all of trying to guard their flock at all. No, they just fling the doors open, any, anything and everything. And I, I'm telling you, it doesn't stop with Christians. You see this? It's got a heart in the middle. So you've got Christianity, you have Islam, you have Judaism, uh, Hinduism, uh, some of these other stuff, I'm not quite sure what they are. Uh, probably Taoism, all these different religions, and it's all come together. Interfaith dialogue, you know, uh, uh, King Charles, after his mother died, you know, he got in trouble because he spoke as the head of the king of, uh, head of the Church of England, the king of England, he's head of the Church of England, and he's supposed to be the defender of the faith, the Christian faith. But he changed it, he says, I'm the, I'm the defender of faith. And when he was in the in St. Anne's Cathedral in Belfast, and they had some sort of, in fact, they had these guys everywhere, these um, Hindu gurus, you know, these Buddhist monks and stuff, and they would come in, you ever see them? I know you probably don't follow King Charles or whatever, but anyway, I'm just making the illustration. He comes in, he does this. See, he's not just for the Christian faith, he's for all faiths. I'm going to tell you something, in the tribulation period, this is going to mark this period of time. It's not just for the church. This is going to go beyond it. When the three believers are taken out, this thing's going to accelerate. Um, so, and this is uh, so this this word, this Greek word for ecumenical, um, This is the this is the uh, symbol of the World Council of Churches, which is an ecumenical body. Okay. By the way, I mean I said something you know derogatory about you know some Martin's person, Billy Graham, the other week. And, uh, but they're, that's, they're all in all that. See, that's, that's all ecumenical. And the problem is they invite the tares in. And the church is not supposed to have tares in it. And so we are to stand against the tares and the wolves and the false prophets. Because if they come in, they wreck the church of God. There's a contest here for truth. Just as in the first parable, there's a contest here for truth in, in the work of the Lord. And so Jesus warned of a time of deception and falsehood during his absence. And this helps us to understand that not everything with the name of Christian truly is. We must beware because there is danger and the church must be careful about its associations, knowing this is a time of imitation and deception. Now here's another little picture. And this is kind of interesting. And if you go online and kind of look at the graphics for ecumenicalism, this comes up a lot. And you notice it's not just Christian, because you have Christian, uh, you have, uh, what is that, Taoism or whatever, and uh, Judaism and Islam. You got all the word religions, but what does that look like? Oh, it's a tree, right? And our next parable is the parable of the mustard seed. The mustard seed, which is the smallest of seeds, and yet it becomes a great, great tree. What does that mean? We're going to look at that next time. There's very important applications of this. You know, well, why don't you have different groups in? Why, you know, I'm finished now, but, you know, again, I got a, um, a 
call from a, a pastor here in town. I don't know if he's still here or not. And he, they, they had these inter, um, interfaith or interdenominational meetings once a month or something here in town. All the different people come in, you know. And he was squ four square gospel. And I told him straight, I said, I'll not be going. And, and by the way, I, I don't have time for it tonight, but you know, God uh, actually de designed for division. He invented it in Genesis chapter 11, and with good reason. Maybe we'll get into that maybe next time. But anyway, I told him, I said, no, we won't be going. He said, again, they get offended, you see. What kind of Christian are you? You don't want to be with other Christians. And I said, well, let me ask you something. I says, do you believe in bap baptizing babies? He says, no. He says, well, you're, the Methodists are going to be there, aren't they? He said, yeah. He says, well, then you have to keep quiet about baby baptism because they practice it and you don't. So you either have a limited fellowship or you have a limited message. You can't, with good ethics, go into a group like that and start talking about, you know, baptism by believers, baptism by immersion, because you're going to offend all the Presbyterians, you're going to offend all the Methodists, and you're not there to offend people. So then you've got to shut up. And see, that's what happens. And the message gets watered down. So it's basically, if you love Jesus, come on in here. But what Jesus are you worshipping? What Jesus is it really that you believe in? You see the quagmire you get into? And so the Lord has given us principles. Uh, to defend the truth and to defend the flock. And um, he says, be careful, beware, because it's a time of deception. And there's imitators out there. Satan has his imitation church, his imitation believers. And um, it's a jungle out there. But it shouldn't be a jungle in here. Dear Lord, thank you for your precious word. And we're, I'm grateful, Lord, for the attention of your people tonight. And these are important things. Help us to realize the time in which we're living. We know it's not always going to be like this because Jesus will come and there won't be any counterfeit. It'll be all true. It'll be all real. But Lord, help us to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Help us, Lord, to understand the world in which we're living and help us to be careful with the trust that you've given us in this church. And help us to love people. And help us to love people here, maybe caught up in deception. But Lord, help us not to be deceived. And help us, Lord, not to be wounded by the darts of Satan. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.